and we are live. Hello and welcome to Fresh Takes with Future Leaders. We're so happy to have you joining us remotely for this important discussion with three leaders who are really affirming in their daily lives and work so much of what you heard today around the positive power of sport. The Fresh Takes session has been designed to get real-time reactions, critiques, and rebuttals from today's young leaders on how they heard this morning's main stage sessions, the social issues that they care about the most, and the impact sport has had on their lives and in their communities. Community lies at the heart of all Concordia does. As we navigate this complex and tumultuous time together, we're focusing on what we do best, building strong networks, bridging partnerships for social impact, and fostering a community to better the world. So we are looking forward to hearing from our inspiring young panelists today about their leadership and experiences within their own communities. Now, before I turn this discussion over to today's moderator and our esteemed young leaders, a few housekeeping tips. All attendees are automatically muted upon entry, but we encourage you all to use the chat feature to interact with other attendees, share thoughts, and make connections. There will be time for questions at the end of the session, so we encourage all attendees to ask and upvote questions during the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be accessible on Concordia's YouTube channel for future viewing in a few weeks. For younger attendees joining us, if you've enjoyed today's conversations and the annual summit, we hope that you will consider becoming a year-round member of Concordia through our Young Professionals Program. To learn more, you can visit our website or reach out to membership at concordia.net. Now with that, I'm gonna let our panelists jump in. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that, uh, Eliza. Uh, my name is Ramsey Poston. I'll be the moderator. I'm based in Washington, DC and uh, run a uh, boutique communications firm where I've had the uh, opportunity to work with both sports organizations and worldwide relief organizations such as Islamic Relief Worldwide. Um, and I think um, I'm really excited about our panel and I'm gonna let each one of them uh, introduce themselves and first provide uh, a little bit of background. And uh, Elvis, I'll, I'll start with you. Hello everyone. My name is Elvis Nshimba and I am the program and evaluation manager at the Kalibuka Football for Hope Center within Malaika. I joined Malaika in 2012 as a teacher. And in 2014, I attended the on-field training on how to use sport as a tool to address social issues, where I became a community impact coach. And I started developing my uh, leadership skills through sports until I became uh, a manager at the center. So what I can say today about Malaika is that Malaika is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2007 by uh, Noela Kursaris Musunka to provide girls, Congolese girls with three education to empower them uh, and empower their community through our four main programs. So we have formal education, we have the community center, we have uh, our wells to provide uh, health uh, and, and clean water in the community, which will ensure good health of the community, the people. And also we have the agriculture program. So these are the four main points in which we work. And in education, we have uh, our school, which provides free access to education to over 300 girls from Kaliboka. And at the community center, we have over 5,000 people who benefit in sports for development in different life skills and who are trained in different social issues. And we have 20 community wells that are providing uh, clean water to over uh, 35 people out of 45 inhabitants of Kalibuka. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Tompkinson. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jamie, and I come from Scotland. Um, and I currently work with an organization called Coaches Across Continents. Um, and at Coaches Across Continents, what we do is we we help organizations all over the world um, design, develop, and implement what we call purposeful play. 
uh, and education outside the classroom. Co play um, is basically we create games with hidden messages that help children and young people and even adults discuss situations or social issues within their communities that are otherwise quite hard topics to discuss. Things like sexual health and gender equality, amongst many other things. Um, and the education outside the classroom part is where all that comes together. We encourage, so for example, last year I was fortunate I went to 15 different countries um, and worked with many different organisations and how they can put these games into a programme and work with their communities. Um, those are my two main roles. Um, aside from that, Coaches Across Continents also works with the organisation themselves. And we provide our partners um, with 28 year-round resources to help upskill their, their organisation, essentially. We help them with things like applying for funding, um, building their social media channels, etc. Um, a quick bit of background about me, I was a youth worker in Edinburgh with an organisation called Spartans Academy for eight years, working in one of the poorest communities of the UK. In 2016, I was fortunate enough to be selected for the Michael, John, Michael Johnson Young Leaders Programme, which was an experience that changed my life. I got to go to Dallas um, and meet other young leaders and meet coaches across continents, most importantly, where I then became a volunteer for about three years, um, which enabled me to go to places like India, Armenia, Albania. Um, and then last year, I became a, a full-time member of staff. Thank you. And uh, we also have Lena Khalifa, who's the founder and owner of SheFighter. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Lena Khalifa. I'm the founder of SheFighter, which is a first soft defense academy for women, started in Jordan, the Middle East, and grow in more than 35 countries. So technically with the SheFighter, it's a martial arts slash soft defense system designed only for women to impact women's lives, to end violence against women and to build their self-confidence. So we don't just work on women uh, physically, we work on them psychologically. We work a lot on their thoughts, their brain and their ego and fears to overcome um, certain things in their lives. So it's a whole academy, it's like a school. And we have started in 2012 in Jordan and uh, we are now in many countries uh, by providing the the martial arts, the she fighter uh, training of trainers program uh, globally. So we certified about 600 uh, instructors globally and we trained and empowered more than 18,000 women globally. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm located now in Toronto, Canada, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Lena. Let me, let me start with you, because uh, this is fascinating. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, what led you to start she fighter what, what, why did you do this oh yeah first uh, um uh, my background is in martial arts i started taekwondo since a very young age like five six years old and it built a lot of confidence in me it made me a leader by nature and uh, it helped me learn a lot about responsibility commitment and discipline so when i started uh, growing up i was like early 20s I had a friend who was abused by her father and brother and came one time to the university with bruises on her face, which made me angry. And uh, I said, why don't you do something? Why don't you stand up for yourself, even though it's domestic violence? And she said, Lena, let's just be honest about it. Women are weak. We cannot really do anything about it. And I was really upset because I did not believe women are weak. I believe it's just a choice. And women, if they are, if they're brainwashed that they are weak, they're going to believe that they're weak. But if they believe they're strong, they're going to be strong. It's just what you believe and how you can turn your thoughts into, into your life and your physical abilities. So I started at a very young age teaching women self-defense at the basement of my parents' house. And then uh, I took the risk in starting She Fighter, the, the first uh, the self-defense studio in 2012, and that's how I started the whole movement of Sheep Fighter. Um, thank you. Um, Elvis, let me move to you, and, and we, we want to learn more about uh, the foundation and how um, sport is associated with competitiveness and when that can be a benefit and if it can be a detriment ever. 
Yeah, so uh, Malaika was founded and it brings education. So we bring education, what you call formal education in the classroom. But today I'm, I would like to talk more about how we do education with sports um, at the community center and to talk about the aspect of competition in sport. So we use sport as a tool that we use for educating people in Kalibuka and we educate them around different social issues we have. These are gender inequalities, or we would like to talk about uh, environment, we would like to talk about child's rights, or conflict prevention and so on. And then we use sport. So what we do is that we have out of school youths whose parents can't afford to send them to schools. And then we have the ball, we have the ground, then we call them and we ask them to come and play, to have fun. And then after that, we enroll them. We bring them in our classrooms. And then through the games that we do in the pitch, we consider one principle, learning by having fun. So it, it's a kind of funny games that we do. They have fun, but at the end of every game, we have a conversation with them. We try to discuss. And then after the discussion, we change the rules and then we continue like that. And then the aspect of education in what you call sports for good, uh, competition is linked to winning and winning is defined differently. It's not like um, the traditional or professional sports where they need to participate in tournaments, in leagues, because they need some funds to run their teams. But in the sports for development, competition, we consider competition like something that leads sometimes to cheating and cheating is not honesty and honesty is one of the value that we'd like to build in in the youth and in all of our participants so we define competition differently we put the emphasis on the message what can we learn after the game that is the very important part of our games in our activities it's, it's one of the things that it's really one of the key aspects of sport really anywhere for any community, right? Is, is how do you translate the skills and sportsmanship on the field and take that away off the field, right? So we have for every game, we have the setup and that setup, for example, um, we say that today we're going to play a game uh, that will talk about mental health how the uh, coronavirus created chrome trauma in students, for example. And then we have the setup of the game. That setup shows clearly what it means. Where if, for example, we say we're going to talk about AIDS, how can we prevent from getting AIDS? Then we have the setup. And then we ask some questions. We don't say this game is going to address such issue, but we play. And then after playing, then ask some questions what does it reflect in the real life and then you start giving different answers different comments until one of them will give the true answer and then from there we make a discussion we change the rules together with them and then we play again with new rules then we have the final conversation and we ask them to commit to go and implement that kind of living in in their lives out that's, of the, the center that's very powerful thank you uh Welcome. jamie coaches across continents has been um, a game changer for women uh, in sport. And traditionally, uh, sport has been considered a, a, a masculine uh, activity. But, you know, in, in, in the recent years, 10 or 15 years, we've seen more and more uh, women fielding teams in Olympic level sports, World Cup sports. Talk a little bit about um, what you done and your organization has done to break those stereotypes and get women active in team sports. Yeah, cool. So if I give you a, a personal example, um, in 2018, I went to volunteer with an organization called the Parikrama Humanity Foundation, who are based in Bangalore in India. And part of my volunteering was to identify ways that they could implement sport development or informal education or whatever you'd like to call it um, into their their sort of daily 
lives. And Parikrama hold each morning the sessions for their pupils to attend. They, they run five schools and slums for children who couldn't afford to go to school otherwise. And what I noticed that there was, there was maybe like 40, 45 boys, but only six girls. And from speaking to people and some of the teachers, there was this misconception um, that girls didn't want to play football. When the, when the boys were playing football or handball in the playground, the girls wouldn't join in. Um, but in Spartans, we'd been holding these girls only football festivals for four years. And I saw that like each year, 100 girls would, would be loving it. So I thought, why don't we try in India? Um, so we held one of these festivals and it turned out to be a massive, massive success. Um, after that session, the girls on the session, um, the next game day, instead of six girls, we had 32 girls um, who, who attended the session. And the main takeaway that I took from that is that girls don't, it's not that they don't want to play football, it's that the societal pressures make them feel like they can't or they're not good enough. Actually, all they needed was a safe space to play and express themselves and have fun. And then on the back of that, that festival, they then created their own girls and women's football team. Um, so. There, so certainly there was probably still some resistance and some pressure. Um, was, it, was it as simple as uh, the girls seeing other girls playing, knowing that it's okay to get them there? Or did you have to do more to get uh, more of the girls on the field? So the way that we had, the way that we done it um, was that we done it during school time. We're very, very fortunate to bring them up bottom to the whole thing. So the girls were already at the schools. We just created a separate space for them to spend three hours playing football and playing different games themselves. And I think um, just the act of feeling safe and not having boys laughing at them or other people saying they're not good enough or whatever meant we felt that they were, and that the pressure was relieved. But even then, still after the festival, we had challenges. I mean. What, what became apparent, uh, apparent sorry, was there were six of the girls who, who started coming to the training after the festival whose parents told them not to. They were not allowed to because the girls were meant to cook and they were meant to clean and they weren't meant to play football. But the girls still snuck out and came to the training anyway and eventually their parents, after conversation, seen that, okay, this is something that I should be encouraging my daughter to do. She's happy. Um, let me go back and I'll ask everyone this. I'll start with you. Is there a time when... Uh, in the future, you see the integration of boys and girls playing together? Um, I think it's becoming more, more common now, um, up to a certain age, because you have puberty and physical differences, and that there becomes a point where it breaks off. But if I take the example in Scotland, it, we've been trying to do it for years, but it's still not. It doesn't happen very often. So I think it's an ongoing challenge, but I also believe that if girls are quite happy just playing with girls, then they're, that's not a problem. As long as they're comfortable and safe and feel happy, then I don't feel the need to, we need to pressure them to mix with boys or whatever. Right, right. Getting on the field is, is the big goal there. Absolutely. Um, Elvis, same kind of question. Is, is there, you, will these, uh, will the girls, do you think in the future remain separate or will there be an integration between boys and girls here? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, do you foresee a time where there will be an integration between the boys and girls playing uh, football together? Yeah, so that has happened in, in Karebuka and it's something that we are proud of. Um, you know, one must know that when we started uh, running the community center in 2013, there was a kind of gender discrimination. Boys didn't like to play with girls. And when you say, can you try to play together? They say, oh no, girls are going to slow us down. Oh no, they are not as strong as we are. And we don't want to play with them, but they can have their own field and they can play themselves. This happened. And then thanks to games that we have been uh, using to teach them about social inclusion, about gender equality, we have some good references. I, it impacted positive our communities. I can give here some examples of female beneficiaries who became sources of inspiration to all of the girls in, uh, in, in Kalibuka and at Malaika. The example of Divina. Divina is one of our first ever beneficiaries. 
She's a girl who stopped uh, learning at the school because she was pregnant and her parents stopped paying for her studies. And she was ashamed, she was at home with her friends. But then one day she decided to join the center and play sport while her friend said, oh, you see, if you go to play sport, then you wear pants, well, you not be married, you have this and that. So the link between her and her friends stopped suddenly because she was playing sport. But thanks to sport, she built her confidence and she went back to school. She graduated, now she's working with us. And his father had, has a job today as one of our guards. So she started impacting and inspiring different girls in the community. And then one of the girls followed her, the case of Jocelyn, whose parents couldn't afford to send her to schools. Then she started playing and she developed her sports skills until she had the chance to go back to school. And today she's in grade nine and we are really proud of her. So thanks to that program, uh, the approach of using gender equality, today we have boys team, we have girls team at the center, and every day in the morning, our literacy programs where we have boys and girls, they will play together. There's no difference in the pitch. So it's a kind of result. But at the beginning, it wasn't that way. Sport was really masculine and girls didn't build their confidence. They were afraid, they were shy, and they didn't want to play because if they play, people are going to see them. But thanks to uh, different games, messages, encouragement, we have uh, impacted thousands of people. And I can even say here that the center is visited every year by over 5,000 people. And among them, 60% are female participants. Wow, thank you, thank you. Uh, Lena, I know that uh, Chief Fighter, uh, for the, your younger students, uh, they're, they're integrated and then, and then it, the, the concentration is on uh, females. And I think your situation is a little bit different, but talk a little bit about how you see the future and, of your company and, and your training progressing. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, what I noticed, I mean, I was in a martial arts studio and uh, sports that are mostly dominated by uh, men, but uh, there is lack of um, facilities that are provided for women. That's why they don't join sometimes. Like for example, I was in South Korea last year at the martial arts summit and we were discussing why there is not much uh, women in the martial arts world. And then I told them simple things like having a changing room in the martial arts dojo, they call it dojo school academy, can actually increase the demand of these women joining. That's number one. Number two would be having female coaches. I mean, some, I know it's uh, important to have male coaches and female coaches, but you need more female coaches mm -hmm. because these little girls will be uh, inspired by those female coaches and role models and they want to be like them. And they actually, they have this kind of trust uh, with the female coaches. They can tell them whatever they, they feel because uh, men and women are different in their uh, biology. And sometimes uh, women and girls, especially if they're like teenagers or kids, they have some private things they want to talk about. And it's going to be really hard to talk about it with a male coach. So it's very important to increase awareness and increase the, the female coaches uh, on the field. I mean, of course, uh, uh, with uh, Jamie, with the football, I think if there's more uh, female uh, coaches uh, on the field, they probably would be more interested, like the girls would be interested to join and the parents would trust more that they can enroll their kids in the, in the training because they can trust that there is a female um, coach. So what I noticed in my studio, in my academy, everybody said that, uh, you know, this idea will not work. Women will not be interested in self-defense. But what I did is I just had uh, female coaches. So I empower women. So it's like by women, to women. And we started having a lot of demand because parents by nature trust to send their daughter, like especially like uh, little daughter, especially if she's like 11, 10, to a female only uh, studio or a club because they can trust that she's not gonna get harassed. Nobody's gonna touch her in a bad way. And unfortunately, when I was in martial arts, some coaches, male coaches, they do get advantage of them being in power and they either put their hand on your shoulder 
or look at you in a, in a way that you will not feel okay training in that place anymore. The girls might not express it really to the management, let's say, but they would definitely just leave without coming back. And I've seen a lot of harassment between, unfortunately, male coaches um, in different uh, backgrounds of sports. I mean, in boxing, in, uh, in, in football, in basketball, and they always favor some girls uh, to join the team uh, other than other girls that consider to be a little bit weaker. But if you empower everybody, like, like for example, I'll give you a story. There was um, a girl that is a little bit uh, overweight and she came to my uh, school uh, looking for training. And she said, I went to this jujitsu club and they told me lose weight and then come come train with us. We do not accept girls, you know, ha like fat girls. And they said that to her. I mean, why don't you accept all kinds of girls and uh, just all different body sizes? This is totally not right. So what, what I did is we accept all kinds of girls, women, even if, even if they have even some kind of like disabilities like autism, um, wheelchair, a blind, deaf, we, we have everybody equal. Of course, we do like kind of separation in the training of like focusing mostly on uh, uh, if they need more care. But um, definitely uh, people need to look into sports because I've been in, in the sports field for almost all my life. Also, the federations are dominant by men. Uh, they favor, um, they have a lot of favorism when it comes to who's going to represent the country in the Olympics, who's going to join. Uh, and there's some kind of kind of like uh, favorism um, slash corruption, unfortunately, in a lot of different uh, countries. Uh, so I stepped out of everything and I created my own school and academy with my own rules. Um, and you don't have to be as a woman, you don't have to be nice to your coach in order to get to the national team or to win a gold medal or like to just travel with the national team. You just have to be who you are if you're good then you're gonna represent the, your country. If you're not good, you need more training. But I've seen it. You have some, some girls had to, different ways of, um, unfortunately, like uh, just being nice with the coach, bringing him food, whatever, just to be in that level of, uh, just to travel and represent, like being in the national team. And I always hated that, like why women had to do extra effort in order for them to join some kind of sport or like to, to do any cha championship. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start uh, my own academy with my own philosophy and with the philosophy of just empowerment, period. That said, empowerment for all girls, all women. We even have grandmothers in the training. Anybody who think that or the society make them believe that they're weak, they're welcome. <laughs> so we don't just accept fighters, we accept normal girls who like to, you know, spend a lot of time, you know, just, uh, just being themselves, you know, like even whether they want to play with the, with Barbies or dolls, or even like put, you know, all makeup on. It's like, it's completely acceptable as long as they start uh, shifting their belief system and believe more in themselves um, and, and be accepted. Uh, of course, uh, everybody accepts them in the community. So that's our philosophy is just to work on, on, on real internal empowerment for women. And well, and, well, thank you for that. And your work, clearly there's um, uh, more, more work to be done. Let me um, pivot to this uh, and stay with you, Lena. Obviously um, COVID-19 has, you know, is a global pandemic has affected uh, just about everyone on earth um can you talk a little bit about how you've had uh to ad adapt to the pandemic and how do you uh keep your program on track during these times oh yeah for sure i mean being an entrepreneur before even starting any kind of um, a sports school or a studio being an entrepreneur you have to adapt you cannot be doing the same way you did you did business 10 years ago so you need to adapt. It's like riding a wave. If you ask surfers, uh, they would tell you, sometimes we travel to Australia or uh, to ride big waves and uh, we, don't, we don't expect how the wave would be, but we need to adapt. We cannot just say, I cannot ride that wave. 
So uh, as an entrepreneur, I, I had to adapt. So the thing is, of course, I love in-person work and I love, I had a lot of events booked. I had conferences, uh, speaking engagements booked all for 2020, but then I took time by myself when the pandemic happened. I did not directly adapt. I took like, I, I took a break. I took like a, a month break. Um, I was sitting by myself thinking, how can I um, use this, use the technology as a tool to, to uh, even reach more and more uh, women. So what I did is the first thing I connected to my network, I brainstormed with them. And then we came up with um, uh, just moving online <laughs> with everything we do. Um, and it got me the idea in summer to start filming and recording all the training of trainers courses we had. So we had like six, uh, six manuals and they're all accredited. So the thing is I did not have them online. So I finished everything. I put the, you know, all the training of trainers certification process online. And now I have people enrolling in the online courses, which is great. And I started, uh, a kind of talk show called the empowerment zone <laughs> where I, uh, invite, uh, weekly, uh, different martial artists, females from different backgrounds, um, you know, talking about, uh, gender equality and how it's important for women to be joining, or at least in their lives to join and learn some kind of self-defense and martial arts sports. That's great. Where can the uh, talk show be found? Oh, uh, so if they go on shefighter.com uh, slash events, um, that's a talk show. Like my next uh, talk would be with an amazing woman uh, that, is, that is disabled herself, but she's teaching women and men with disabilities all her life, mostly like in self-defense and uh, Aikido. And yeah, it's going to be amazing, like talking about uh, disabilities and how they can also defend themselves. So uh, it's going to be like uh, everything is on shefighter.com and the online courses as well. Remarkable. Thank you. Um, Elvis, um, talk about how you've been able to overcome the challenges of COVID and still running uh, the school um as it's and and give us an update on what the situation is today um so as uh, lena has said one of the great vocabularies we can use is adapt we try to adapt our activities and we knew that the pandemic came to oblige us new rules new instructions that we have to follow if we'd like to keep uh moving forward but we are very grateful to our donors and uh, uh, different people who work with us. We have been able to survive and we have also helped our communities. So we took the pandemic, the lockdown as an opportunity to learn how we could help our beneficiaries differently. So what we did is uh, we did some campaigns and through to those campaigns, we started distributing food to community members starting by our beneficiaries to the rest of the community members in Kalibuka and beyond Kalibuka. But also the community center where we have women is not only for sports. So sport is like the main central activity, but around sport we have different activities that, that we do. We did sewing with women and we use their sewing skills during the lockdown to sell masks that we have been distributing to different people in Kalibuka, in the surrounding villages. And at the school, our 12, 14 years students started printing shields that we have been distributing to different hospitals. So we adapted, but all of the local staff have been uh, being paid during the lockdown. And after the lockdown, we came back and we keep moving forward, but we, some new restrictions on how we can keep going forward and impacting the community despite uh, the COVID-19. Uh, thank you. Um, and Jamie, uh, as a worldwide organization um, with, um, you've got operations everywhere. How, how has uh, coaches across continents dealt with COVID-19? Yeah, so initially, all over the world, as you know, everywhere went into lockdown. Um, so our delivery part um, was on hold. So the first thing we done was develop a curriculum. Um, how can we teach our children in communities how to be safe 
during coronavirus while playing because that's what we do. We like everything to be while play. And that brought certain own challenges because when you play and children play, they want to touch and they want to go about moving everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we developed our first coronavirus curriculum, um, which we then started sending out to our partners for when they came out of lockdown and restrictions started to ease and they could start playing games again. Um, the second part was we, we went digital, of course, like everybody else. Um, we were in regular contact with all our partners, um, Elvis included. Elvis and I spoke weekly most days, to be honest. Um, and we're now looking to expand on that and continue how, how we can give education outside the classroom online. Um, and that's going to be rolling out throughout the rest of the year. And the last part is the most recent part. As the world has started to come out of lockdown um, and children have started to be able to gather and people have been able to start to gather, we've been supporting our partners and our community impact coaches um, so that they can deliver the curriculum that we create to their communities. Um, under these exceptional circumstances and that involved we had to do some research and come up with certain procedures on how to safely play and all of that stuff and make sure that when we were supporting our partners to deliver these programs um, they were being safe so so far we've held five of those um, in various places mostly in Africa at the moment Elvis delivered one of them he's done a great job um, but yeah I suppose the unique challenge of sport, particularly football or handball um, and the touching was, was the biggest part that we had to adapt to, um, which was hence the new curriculum. The, um, turning a little bit about to um, kind of peace, um, how, how can sport contribute to the promotion of peace and development? Um, to me, there's two aspects to it. There's local um, and there's international. So if I give you a local example, at Spartans, we work with gangs um, of kids and teenagers, um, unfortunately, in areas that, that we are at, very poor and impoverished areas, gang culture is a thing. Um, but what's funny about conflict in these situations is these kids grow up hating people they don't even know. They've never met them. But because they come from a different area, they've heard someone older than them tell them, oh, we don't like these people because they come from a certain postcode. And that's where I think it was Lena touched on positive role models. A lot of times in these places, there are no positive role models and ambitions are low. So one of the things we've done to challenge that is we, we picked up two goals, two very small goals, and we put them in a car park in the middle of the two areas every Tuesday night and we'd invite anybody to come and play. And over time these children learned to interact with each other because they, they grew to know each other. Um, so us being there and being those mediators and actually demonstrating, oh, these people are actually okay, let's play football. Um, and again, that's what I touched on earlier, creating that safe environment where people can be themselves and not be judged and helps to build those relationships. On an international level, um, one of my favorite stories ever is of the Christmas Day peace truce where the, the German soldiers and the British soldiers decided, no, it's Christmas Day, let's, let's play football. And again, that's because they, they didn't want to be there. Someone told them they had to be there and they, they had to not like these people. And I think that's a great evidence of how sport can bring people together to and put aside their differences because other people have told them not to like each other. One example from coaches across continents is last year, um, we were at a conference in Qatar um, and we took some of our volunteers and we had people from India and Pakistan all talking and chatting and but well, their countries are, are traditionally very much at war against each other but these people have nothing to do with that. And sport brought them together and enabled them to sit and have a conversation in a safe environment. That's, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, Elvis, same type of question. What, 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 are, you, what are you seeing um, there in terms of the relationship between sport and, and peace and development going forward? Yeah, so as Jamie has said, sport is a powerful tool and it brings people together. Where there is a ball, where they practice sport, there is only fun. 
people have to cry, people have different reactions, but it's an opportunity that we always use at the center to bring people and we talk about peace through the games first. We talk about how we can prevent conflicts in, in a group of children or in the community and how we can solve uh, those problems. If there is a conflict, then we teach our students, our youths, how to solve the conflict themselves, the conflict resolution. And this, we, we use uh, the approach on which we involve our youths in the games first. And then after that, we have big events we do because at Malaika, we celebrate almost all important international days, including um, the Peace One Day, which we work closely with coaches across continents with the resources and we implement them. So we, do, we have some strategies we use, for example, planning a tournament and we can select a kind of beneficiaries. Maybe we take regional schools and then we do a tournament with schools or we do tournament with local teams. Then the day of the finals, we do the campaign across the village calling everyone to come to watch the finals, to say how it will be very interesting. And then when they come, they are eager to watch the football match, but we don't play. And then we have the message. It can be a, a lecture. And then after the lecture, we have a question and answer session, where it can be a kind of conference debate outside with everyone, someone talks about peace, with its different layers, peace, because peace starts first by someone within himself. It doesn't start in the group. It starts first by someone in his mind. He feels that he's in peace and then peace goes into family and then it goes out of the family in a small group of people, then in a society, in a huge community. Then we try to take all of those kinds of aspects in the discourse we have with people. And then we try to discuss everything. After that, then we start the football match and then at the end, we emphasize again on peace, on the message. Then we give the, the trophy or what we have. So it's, it's generational is what you would say. If you can instill some of these um, beliefs and skills internally, that when they become parents, then they pass on those lessons to their children as well. Yes, sure. Um, Lena, uh, from your perspective, um, obviously, again, very unique. Um, you run a worldwide um, defense academy. How does that translate into peace uh, for your students? Uh, oh, of course. Uh, learning, uh, we always say we teach you how to fight in order not to fight. So mm -hmm. if if you want to really avoid getting attacked in your life or having a lot of negative uh, people coming to you, you need to learn how to deal with that first and then you will never attract it in your life. Uh, what I noticed working with a um, lot of people and women uh, globally that there are some women in the same community that they have a lot of violence in their lives and they get uh, abused and attacked by someone uh, close in the family or they are just in um, victim mode all the time. They're, they feel victims. And there are women who even, they believe that they're fighters. They believe nobody can touch them. And these women, nobody ever had to hurt them in their lives. It's just, uh, we, um, we work uh, a lot on how you, how you think about yourself internally first, not even being a woman or a man your words will become things. If you keep it uh, in your head uh, for a long time, believing that you might get attacked and you will not know how to do something about it, or uh, if you feel that you're weak, then your body will directly start, uh, the cells in your body even, will start uh, you know, showing, it will show on your body that you're becoming weak and weak and weak by day. It's a daily practice on what you believe in yourself. So we, we do work uh, a lot on, on women just sometimes practicing how they talk to themselves like they're talking to their best friend. So for example, if your best friend is going into a tough time 
what would you say to them? You would say, you can do this, you know, you're very strong, I believe in you, but why don't we talk to ourselves the same way? If we talk to ourselves the same way every single day, then we will have more confidence in, in ourselves. Our bodies will start even becoming stronger, even without practice. I mean, the, pra the physical practice will even make it better and better as you start uh, going into the practice. But the mental practice is very important as well because I've trained um, fighters, like girls who are really, really into, into fighting. They're very strong physically, but uh, sometimes something small can destroy them. And um, it's, it's all mentally, it's all inside. And then I realized it's not just the physical, uh, physical strength that we need to work on. It's just, it's also mentally, it's connected mind and body. Um, and we need to work on both. I think at uh, some point we need to create something like how we have gyms all over the world to lose weight and practice. We need to have a mind gym. We need to uh, work on people's thoughts, kids' thoughts, and uh, to, to influence our environment and to shape up our environment in a better way. I mean, definitely a martial arts is considered a, a very peaceful sport because once you by by nature by you know human nature is to learn how to fight um it's like food it's like sleeping you have to learn how to fight if you avoid it you're gonna either uh, use it in the streets like we see a lot of uh, gun violence uh, in different countries and uh, there's a lot of violence uh, going on with with uh, cultures that do not really uh, champion martial arts like for example if you go to south korea it's like one of the safest countries in the world it's so big in martial arts they don't even have to use it in the street they have discipline respect and i like you feel safe there that you can throw your mobile in the middle of the subway and someone will you know find you and give it to you that's how uh, the culture is influenced a lot by the um, mythology of the martial arts so i believe it's a peaceful sport we all need girls and boys and we need to learn how to fight in order not to fight in, and in order not to attract any violence to our, to our lives. And I absolutely love the idea of um, mental gyms um, and getting, uh, we talk a lot about mind and body, but clearly it's, it's two tracks, two different tracks, uh, but they need to be uh, together, uh, both in strengthening both the mind and the body. Um, Lena, this actually leads into kind of our next topic, which is social justice. We are seeing, especially here stateside, uh, we are seeing professional athletes uh, and amateur athletes uh, take um, more public and vis um, visible stands for social justice. Um, from your perspective, where do you see the trend going among um, uh, the groups that you're working with worldwide? Um, definitely having a voice and speaking about it is very, very important. But sometimes we have to learn how to be silent as well. Silence can be even um, stronger than words. Uh, we underestimate the value of silence. <laughs> but uh, that's why sometimes I say you have to speak up and sometimes you don't have to speak up. So depends on the situation. And of course, if there is injustice going on, uh, I, would, um, I, would always, uh, I would always like value if they have different projects invested in certain projects to solve the problem, not just you know, uh, having different demonstrations about it or going outside in the street, which is great. But at the same time, what are you doing with your energy? You need to invest it in a project that will help the other people um, benefit from it and follow you and then you will receive grants the more projects you have the the, the better this you know solving problems would be um, i mean i was in uh, in italy uh, before two years and a lot of organizations uh, talk to me about a lot of feminism movements but at the same time, they tell me, but they don't run any kind of project, uh, like, for example, the school I'm running. And they say they just love to just sometimes uh, go and demonstrate a lot. But I, uh, I, I believe use, it, use your energy right and use it in a, in a positive way more than a negative way. Because if you are, it's all vibration in this world. And the more energy 
good energy you you invest in the more you you you'll find that even uh, your life is changing other people's life is, is changing just the way you use energy right so if you invest it in building even mother teresa said it she said uh uh, people will try to destroy what you built for uh, for years, built anyway. It's important for us uh, human beings to know that we are here to build, not destroy. And the more we add energy to it, the more our world will become better for the ne uh, next generation. So I feel I'm here on earth to build. Um, if there is, if I feel like there is a lot of uh, uh, destruction going on and, and it's like a lot of negative energy, sometimes I try to keep uh, the same uh, mission and vision as I'm going in the same energy and surround myself with that energy so I can keep building in, uh, in a world that is full of uh, negative energy. So it's important to keep that light. Uh, it's important to be stronger than the darkness. And, um, and we've seen it during the pandemic. I've seen a lot of, uh, uh, it's not even the pandemic that killed them. It's, uh, it's their, uh, their depression. Um, people are uh, isolated and people uh, suddenly had to be, uh, some people can't adopt. Some people are not born leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to adopt for leaders. How is it going to be even for normal people and especially young people? So I've seen suicidal rates, unfortunately, happening. Um, but it's very important to take care of our words and how we address it to the public because it will affect uh, affect their lives and it's going to cause harm more than uh, more than something good. So, uh, yeah, I believe in all of that. So it's important to choose your words. Thank you. Uh, Elvis, um, talk about a little, a little bit about how everything you're doing um, can help translate to greater social justice. So what you are doing first, one would ask a question to know, why is the Malika school only for girls? The, prior to Malika, uh, people of Karebuka were used to sending um, their boys to schools, but then girls, no. They were encouraged to stay home because it's quite far from Karebuka to Lubumbashi where they could find schools. And then parents said, oh, you see, it's not safe for you to live from here, to cross all of this bush to Lubumbashi. So please stay home and help your mother and get ready for your marriage and so on, so that you'll be able to run your household. And then when Malaika came, our great word that we use is empowerment. We empower not only girls, but we empower the whole community. And in empowerment, we talk about social justice. We talk about equalities, equalities in education, equalities in opportunity, equalities in access to sports, equalities in access to uh, health um, infrastructures and equality in everything. So even in sport, we don't feel that it's really fair if we have more competition for men and we don't have competition for women, it's not fair. So what you do at Malika is that we try to balance both sides. And even in the structure of Malika, uh, locally, the country manager is a woman, and then the one who comes after her is a man. Among coaches, we have um, female coaches and male coaches, and we try always to balance. Because in our gender action plan, for example, we realized that we have more uh, boys who are really active in sports, but girls come, but they are not so active. And then the strategy that we did in order to bring social justice here is that uh, first, we don't exclude anyone. We include everyone in sports. And in terms of human resources on the side of coaches, we try to make it equal. If we would like to train new peer leaders, we'll have five, five girls, five boys, and then we make sure everyone is happy. Mm. So we don't try to discriminate, uh, to say, no, you are a girl, you can't do this. Well, you are a boy, you can do this. So what we preach to our youths and students at the center, at the school, is to believe in themselves, to have confidence, and to think 
to be convinced that they can be whatever they want. And if a child, a girl, say that, for example, I want to play, we help her play. The one who says, I want to be this, I want to be that, we try to go together with her so that she can meet and make a reality uh, her dream. This is um, what we do at Malaika. But we also extend these activities with parents. We don't only do with students. We know we are working with youths and we expect the real change maybe very soon, maybe not really very soon in the future, but we don't want to leave parents behind because if we leave them behind, we'll not be sure that we are really going in a nice, uh, in a, a nice way. So we always have kinds of conferences with parents. Sometimes we try to ask them questions and they give answers and then we help them. Well, we conduct some indoor surveys in the community. We design some questions and we try asking them what they think. And we realize that it stuck to uh, the mindset. The mindset is stuck to tradition because the tradition before whatever we are doing here say men are more advantaged than women. Men had access to lots of resources while women couldn't. And then after we do the survey, then we try to design kinds of activities that we can do in order to help them. And then we see how they change uh, the ways of thinking. Thank you. Um, Jamie, uh, we just have a couple minutes, but uh, quickly talk a little bit about how what you're seeing um, around the world um, with your athletes and being spokespeople for social justice. Yeah, I mean, I think we live in the world of social media now where celebrities and athletes have 2 million followers here and whatever, and people can say something and they don't realize the ripple effects it has. A particularly celebrities and athletes on social media. I think it goes back to what Lena says about just saying stuff and not thinking about it and having no actions behind it. Um, so social media at the moment is one of the most problematic and also powerful tools. It can be used for a lot of positive things um, when people do it right. So what we're doing just now at Coaches Across Continents is we're developing something um, to help combat social media issues. Sorry, I got distracted there. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to develop programs to educate kids um, around social media and what just tweeting something, the impact that can have. Um, but I mean, as I said, it can also be used for many good reasons. Um, if I take Michael Johnson, um, who, as I mentioned earlier, I was part of the Michael Johnson Young Leaders Foundation. He has said a lot of powerful things in his life, um, but then he goes and creates a foundation to actually do something about it. Kenyon Drake, who we listened to earlier, is another fantastic example of being an athlete or someone in a, a position of power and influence um, who can put their mind to it and actually create so much social change by being a positive influence. Thank you. One thing I want to do before we uh, before our session ends, I'm going to start with Lena because I know she's uh, got a time commitment here, but I would like each of you to briefly talk about how others can help your organizations and what they can do uh, to help continue your um, progress and success. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, being just here at the conference is amazing for people to listen uh, what we're going to share and talk about and how we're solving different problems. Uh, but I would love, uh, you know, if people uh, would get uh, on my website to join different events or just uh, spread the, the word out there. So I'm just going to say the website, cheapfighter.com. Um, I would also uh, like encourage if you have daughters or, or kids, send them to <laughs> some kind of uh, fighting school to learn how to stand up for themselves when they grow up. Thank you. Um, Elvis? How, how can people um, help your organization or be involved? Yeah, so we, we encourage everyone to be involved and we encourage everyone to volunteer with us, uh, even online as the pandemic doesn't allow us to travel. And we encourage everyone to visit um, our website and our social media handles 
all our social media handles are Malaika DRC. So when you type Malaika DRC, you find, and we have links in our bio. So bios that everyone can visit and see uh, how they can help us. We need really more help in terms of technology because uh, COVID-19 has taught us that there is a very big disparity uh, in terms of access to resources. Uh, the few months that we spent out of uh, the yard without working, uh, children, youths and parents in Kalibuka couldn't have access to technology. So it's something that we'd like to develop even in the future. We'd like to teach our youths how to use devices and how to get connected to have different resources. It's a kind of aspect where we invite people to help us, but also to help uh, in different programs. If you go to the website, you find different programs and one can choose which one is the best for him to help either at the school or at the community center in terms of spots for development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and for all your insight, uh, Jamie, same thing. How, how can people get involved or um, learn more about um, uh, uh, coaches across continents? Yeah, so our, our website is coachesacrosscontinents.org um, and there's lots of information on there. Our Twitter is at coachesacross. Um, we are, we're always looking to speak and learn from other organizations um, around the world um, and looking at build those mutually beneficial partnerships so that we can continue to grow as an organization, but we can also hopefully support other organizations to reach their goals. Um, well, thank you um, very much. Um, I, I, I know that there is, uh, I think we're, I think our time is pretty close up, but I just, I want to appreciate everyone who's logged in, uh, say that I appreciate everyone that has logged in. There is a Q&A button. Are there any other questions for our panelists? Uh, let's see here. Um, I think not. Um, Jamie, Elvis, thank you. I want to thank uh, Concordia for putting this on. Um, it, uh, I think this uh, concludes uh, the Fresh Takes Sports, Arts, and Education. So thank you, for everyone, for your participation. Thank you for, for allowing me the opportunity to be on this. Thank you for bringing us here. It was really nice being there. Thank you. Good luck, everyone.